Lighthouse Church presents the following message by Pastor Jason Holloman. Uh, if you have your Bible, if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 7. So we are in our eighth week of uh, Genesis. Uh, for those of you that haven't been with us, um, the reason why it's eight weeks and not seven weeks is because the first week was Genesis 0.5 where we talk about uh, Jesus Christ in the midst of the creation narrative. It's an important facet, right? Because he was present in the act of creation. And, uh, and, and then so today we're in Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7 is one of the three chapters where we find ourselves in the Noahic flood account. And so it's a significant event in the church. And uh, when we get to the application, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, a little bit more about just what this has looked like uh, throughout um, uh, throughout church history, and and uh, and I think what you'll find is that so many want to make this a myth. We really want to make this a myth because nobody likes the idea of God putting forth judgment on a wicked earth. Who wants that, right? And so I'm going to read all the way through chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 1, all the way to the end of the verse, and then we're going to pray for our text today. Let's pray, or excuse me, let's read God's word. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all of your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. Verse 4. And for seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. Verse 7. And Noah said, uh, excuse me, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives were with him, and they went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of the clean animals and of the animals that are not clean, and of birds and of everything that creeps upon the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah. As God had commanded Noah. Verse 10. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In, six, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, and on the 17th day of the month, and on that day, the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 13. In the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons were with them and entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all of the livestock according to its kind, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth according to its kind, every bird according to its kind, and every winged creature. Verse 15. Then they went into the ark with Noah, Two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that had entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. Verse 17. And the flood continued forty days upon the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. Verse 18, and the waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed so that mighty on the earth, that the high mountains under the whole heavens were covered, and the waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, livestock, bees, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, and all of mankind, everything on dry land, and whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. And he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. 
before we pray, after reading God's word, um, I felt pressed by the Spirit to, to do this. There, there are two individuals, nameless individuals, that I think we as a congregation should pray for. One, and, and to encourage this individual, uh, you're coming up on an anniversary where you and your husband are separated for circumstances, and, and we talked this morning, we want the congregation to pray for you. We'll leave you nameless, but we want to pray for you. You're struggling today. Today is a hard day. We want you to be prayed for. There's another nameless person here, and we've had a hard time connecting. You have a very specific schedule. You can only talk at a specific time, and we will connect this week, but you also are struggling and so for these two individuals that feel alone in this season, church, let's pray for our passage today, and let's pray for these two members who today are really struggling. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bless this sister who struggles today. We ask in the name of Christ that she would feel the presence of the Spirit, that the church would just even now, just surround her in lifting her up. We ask in the name of Christ that you would make a way forward for her in her conflict and difficulty and lament. And for this other member who is separated from her spouse, who is about to celebrate a significant anniversary, and yet there's a lament. Even this morning as talking with the sister, I pray blessing upon her. We as a church gather around them and we lift them up. As you lifted the ark in safety, we pray that we as a congregation would lift them to you because you, Father, give good gifts to your children, even in the midst of lament. We thank you that we can pray for them. We ask that you would empower us as we look at this word. What a tough, historic moment. Would you help us to be faithful in it? We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as we enter this time, as we look at this, this is fun, but this is also a moment of worldwide destruction. We, talk, we have talked the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the, the, the size of the ark and why that is important. We've talked about so many different facets of this account, because this account spans over three chapters. Next week, uh, Pastor Jeff is going to be talking about Genesis chapter 8, when they open up onto dry land the ark. And so this spans three different chapters. And if you look here, you'll see very quickly in verse 2 that take seven pairs of clean animals, and then further down, and those animals that are not clean. This would be the first instance of where we see this division between clean and unclean animals. This would not have been the case before because there would be no reason for this to be the case before. Remember, there's only been, as we have recorded, a single sacrifice to this point. What was the sacrifice? Do you remember? Anybody? Yes, that's right. When Adam and Eve sinned, then, then there was a sacrifice. There was a blood sacrifice so that uh, they could have clothing of skin. And so to this point, we have yet to have another sacrifice, but we see that clean animals and unclean animals entering the ark was, it was the beginning of the sacrificial system. And if you need more information there, read the book of Leviticus. If you're a new Christian, don't start there. <laughs> like, I love you. We can find a different place for you to start, okay? And we've got some very young believers in here, and so we'll, we'll just find a different spot. Yet, the book of Leviticus is amazing, but you see here already that there's this idea of the sacrificial system. Now remember, we had 120 years. Noah has been building this ark, and he knew that there would be 120 years, and then man would cease to exist. It was just recently said, and, and as we talked last week, that the radicals, the Chinese character, the word for boat uh, in Mandarin was this beautiful picture of of a, a vessel, and then eight, the number eight, and then underneath the number eight, there was mouths, that is to say, eight people um, is the, the, the Chinese Mandarin for boat. And here you see that eight people entered this ark. Now, how many children did Noah have? We don't know. We know that he was a preacher of righteousness for years and years and years, and he was preaching righteousness to a whole bunch of people that thought he was crazy. Not only was he crazy because he was a righteous dude, and was preaching repentance, but he was also building a huge ship in the middle of nowhere, and it had yet to rain. So everybody's like, what are you going to do with that? Like, what do you even do with that? What, what, what is, why are you building this? You get the idea that you, people just thought he was crazy. 
just kind of like this wild guy. And, and yet, here's what's so fun. If you compare what is likely the life of Noah with the life of John the Baptist, it's quite interesting if you begin to see, like, people thought John the Baptist was crazy too, right? And so just this idea that he was just this wild man building this boat in the middle of nowhere. And it comes back to this idea. This is important. Like, to believe this, to believe this narrative is critical, Now, I want to give some different theories and different things that could happen. Those things aren't necessary for orthodox belief. But to not believe that this literally happened is a moment of orthodox belief. This is important. Why? Well, because Jesus talks about this moment. Jesus himself talks about the moment of the Noahic flood. Peter, in in two of his letters, 1st and 2nd Peter, makes reference to Noah and the flood. The writer of Hebrews makes mention to Noah and the flood. In fact, for those of you that are looking at me like you don't believe me, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Very quickly, Matthew chapter 24. Wasn't even planning on this, but guys, I'm already ahead of time. And we're just going to keep our Bibles open. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, not the sun But the Father knows. Again, this is the words of Jesus. For as were the days of Noah, so it will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. So this is Jesus in the New Testament making reference to a specific point in the flood. So, so many like to say, oh, that's a myth. That's a myth. Look, that's why we have so many different languages talking about a flood narrative myth. Of course, yeah, that, you know why there's every continent has flood myths? Because every continent came from the three sons of Noah. That's why every continent has a flood myth. It it makes a total sense. And and here, if this is just myth or folklore or just a story or if it was just a localized flood but not worldwide or whatever the thing might be to try to get away from this being a historic event, then Jesus here sure seems to indicate that what took place was worldwide destruction. Same for Peter in both of his letters, same for the writer of Hebrews. Now, if you look here, if you look here down to verse 10, if you look at verse 4 and 7 days and verse 10 after 7 days, this here is literally just one more moment. You get this idea that, that God says, hey, it's time to enter the ark. And in 7 days, it will begin to rain. You get the sense that in that moment that that Noah probably went out and and started to say, hey, repent, repent, repent. If you believe in Jesus, come into the ark, let's go. In fact, it's very likely that Noah had tons of children, tons, very accurate language here. Uh, He probably had more children than three. I mean, when folks are living six to 900 years, um, in fact, in this period, um, probably the greatest uh, believing scientist uh, that studies this, if you begin to, and there's math models for those of you that are into math, There's math models that are fantastic. But if you look at how long everybody lived and the number of children they probably had, it has been recorded and alleged that there were likely billions of people on the earth at this period of time. You're saying, how was that possible? It's like, it's very possible when you have people living to 900 to have a lot more children than those who are living to 80, 90. And so... So in this, you see that there's just this second, like this second moment, seven days, and then the earth is going to be flooded. And on verse 10, and after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, and on the 17th day of the month, why be so specific? Why be so specific here? It's actually one of my favorite things. If somebody says, oh yeah, there's this really awesome house. You should totally check it out. Super scary for Halloween. All kinds of really weird decorations and all that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, great. Where is it? Ah, you know, it's just up there north. It's like, okay, but where? 
Like, you start to wonder, like, is there really a house? Do they really have spooky decorations, right? But if somebody says, no, 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 there's this really overly decorated house, super scary, and it's at 123 Straight Street, you think, okay, there's a place. Like, that's a, that's a level of detail that makes sense. There's a level of detail that is, if you will, a historic point, right? And so, like, so for instance, any major historic event, whether it be, uh, and I'm not going to go through the historic events, I've got a number in my head, we know the times that it took place. When JFK was shot, we know the exact time right now. Why? It's an historic event. And so if somebody says, hey, in the, you know, in the past, a, a president was shot, it was horrible. It was in Dallas. It's like, really? When? Well, nobody knows. Yeah, it's just lost in the annuals of history. It's like, uh, that's a pretty big deal. We should probably remember when that is, right? When was it that the fountains of deep burst forth? I'm glad you asked. When Noah was 600 years old, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, that day the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of heavens were opened. Now, what does that mean? We get the windows of heaven. Like, that makes sense, right? Rain. Got it. Rain, okay? But when you start using biblical imagery and language, and if you look at the Hebrew of burst forth, I, I am, it's just been a wonderful, terrifying experience to read my Bible and to be in the Genesis Noahic flood account while watching Hurricane Ian in Florida. An unbelievably powerful storm that has, that has just wreaked unbelievable destruction. And then to, to see the, the amount of power and energy created by this cyclone hurricane that has come in and has just come across Florida and now is battering the East Coast. To look at this and to think something from in the earth's core burst forth and it was an unbelievable event. I, I, was, in, uh, the, uh, I was in Yellowstone. Uh, oh, my wife's not in today. Uh, she's in working kids. She would know the date. But it was in the past. It was in the last 10 years. I don't exactly know when in the last 10 years, but it was generally in the last 10 years. We were in Yellowstone. She is my dates person, so I, I need her. I need her bad. No, no, you don't have to go get her. We're good. We're good. And so, uh, so super sweet. That's super sweet. Uh, and so in the last decade, I was in Yellowstone. And that entire area is unbelievably geologically fascinating. And I remember hearing uh, this, one of the, the, the park rangers say, yes, it, this area for, for millions of years. Uh, to a young earth creationist, I was like, oh. And, uh, but but this, this park ranger, I think, got it right when she said, listen, we are sitting underneath so much pressure so much water, so much volcanic activity at any given point. And literally, I just like closed the ears of one of my children. Yes? At any given point, the whole thing could just blow. And I was like, I should have held the ears of all of my children, right? And, uh, and I only scared three of the four, but one of them got through safely, right? And hear me, like when she was talking about this, it's like, no, 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 you have no idea. The entire area is just waiting to just burst forth. And I was like, what's bursting forth? She said, water followed by the pressure of the earth, followed by fire. And I was like, that's amazing. The immediate first thought I had, the immediate first thought that did not come out of my mouth for various reasons was, I cannot imagine if this location would have been in redemptive history, one of the many locations where the earth burst forth water. Hear me. This is an unbelievably powerful moment. Christian geologists say that this was also likely the moment that recontoured the face of the earth. We don't know. You, you don't have to believe that to be orthodox. You simply have to believe that God made a way for his children with an ark when he flooded the earth. Now, when you look at verse 14, according to its kind, livestock according to their kind, that creeps on the earth, everything according to its kind, this is not, this is not a direct affront to Darwinistic evolutionary theory. It's not. It's not at all. What it is, is God's word and Darwinistic evolutionary theory is an affront to it. Why? Because we, we certainly believe in 
and, um, and evolution within species? Of course we believe that. I mean, I can give you all kinds of evidence for those things. We can observe those things for the last hundreds of years. Super easy. But what this is saying is that, that we don't see kind evolution. We don't see one kind ev- evolving into other kinds. This is really, really important. God's word is so clear here that, that everything according to its kind entered the ark. And, and this is a direct affront, frankly, to this idea. If you want to know, if you want to know what is offensive to God, look what the culture celebrates. If you want to know what God loves and cherishes, if you want to see what God celebrates, just watch what culture wants to rip apart. I, I wish it were different. It's just not different. And, and in this, whether it be male and female, whether it be according to its kind, whether it be, whether it be God's faithful, elect, chosen children here with Noah and his three sons and their wives, every part of this, the culture wants to just rip apart. Now, when you look at verse 16, verse 16, and those who entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded them and as and the Lord shut him in. Notice here that this word God is, is the Hebrew Elohim, so which is beautiful because it's the word for God being all-powerful. And then Yahweh, which is the next word, is God being all-sufficient. And in this one verse, you see, and God, uh, as God had commanded them, as Elohim had commanded them, as the, all, as the all-powerful God had commanded them. And then, then you see, and the Lord shut them in. You get this picture, though I don't know if it's true. You get this picture that Noah is in the ark and everybody's in there. And then uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives and all these animals started coming in. And in this moment, you get this idea where when God says, it's done, it's finished, it's time. Like, did, did Noah, like, was he the one pulling up the ropes? If you go to the ark encounter, which I'm, I, I, I make no money on uh, talking about this place, I can assure you. I have spent a fortune there taking my family. Uh, so I, <laughs> this does not serve me in any way. But when you see it and you watch that, that door in front of it and what likely would have had to have been the dimensions given the, the size of the ark, I'm not sure that Noah and his family could have shut that door. It was unbelievable. You get this picture that God in that moment, again, you don't have to believe this little tidbit for it to be orthodox. You don't have to believe this. No, we're just asking the question what could be. But you get this idea that when they enter the ark and he goes to turn to struggle with the door, you just see that God just closes him in. You see that God just takes them. Now, verse 17. Notice, even in the way that I read, 17, the flood continued days upon the earth, and water increased and bore up the ark and rose high above the heavens. It's really fun because there's two different pictures to Isaiah 6 here. And for those of you that don't know Isaiah chapter 6, it's the passage where um, the Lord is high and lifted up, and he is holy, holy, holy. We, we just sang that in our worship set, which is really fun because we didn't even talk about that. I love that. Where's Drew? Is Drew in here? I don't see him. Um, so I don't, know who, I don't know who put the worship set together, but I love that because th- that's literally in the text. Uh, holy, holy, holy. In, in, in English, we have things like uh, best, better. Uh, no, we have things like good, better, best. That's what we have like in English. Hey, this is good. This is better. This is the best, Right? That's not the way it is in Hebrew. In Hebrew, we, have, we, have, um, we, we replicate whatever the singular thing we want to emphasize. So we say, he's holy, and it's like, oh, okay, he's holy. He's like, no, no, he's holy, holy. It's a whoa. No, 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 no. He is holy, holy, holy. And at that point, you say, that's amazing. We see this idea here. We see this idea, the water's prevailed. The water's prevailed. The water's prevailed. We see this same idea from Isaiah 6 when he rose high above the earth. When the waters rose high above the earth is the exact same Hebrew. As he was lifted, he, that is God the Father, was lifted high in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1, and 3 being holy, holy, holy. A beautiful image here in the Hebrew language. For, and, and listen, not all of us really care about the scriptures. I wish it were different. But for those that are deeply interested in, in the nuances of the scriptures, this should just scream at you. This should just be one of those moments where you just think, oh my goodness, Moses, knowing Isaiah, 
is likely writing this and penning this as God the Father is, is transmitting this idea. And he is thinking through this, and it's, it's fantastic if you just chew on it for a few days, which I, by, by God's grace, have had the privilege of chewing on. Now, the waters prevailed, verse 19, so mightily that on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. Okay, so the highest mountain on the earth is... Mount Everest, that's right, 29,000, when I was a kid in school, it was 29,000, 29 feet, 29,000, 29. Today, it's 29,032. Why? Because it's gotten a little bit bigger. Uh, and uh, I have no idea why. I mean, there's actually tons of reasons why, but you get the point. So does that mean that the water was over Everest? Or is that be- was that because it's over Mount Ariat, which is 16,800 feet, give or take? Well, because the ark, and we'll see this next week, the ark rests on Mount Ariat. That's where it lands. And so what what are we to take to this? Well, what we can take to this is that at the time the earth burst forth, we take God's word here to say that the mountains were covered. Now, at the same time, when all of this geologic activity was taking place, was Everest form, was the Himalayan chain form? I don't know. I have no idea. We don't have to believe that or, uh, to be orthodox here, but I can tell you this. It sure is fun to think about. Like, what did this look like? Now, verse 20. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. Now, last week, it was very difficult because the mic was messed up, but last week, I was trying to hold the mic and also show what a cubit is. And so remember, a cubit, depending on how tall a man is, uh, is from the tip of the elbow to the top of the, the longest finger. It should be your middle finger, but hey, not the case for everybody. Some of our toes are longer than others as well. And so uh, anyway, so this is a cubit, right? And based upon the dimensions of the ark, as we uh, have studied, it's likely that Noah was about 6'3", based upon his cubit. And so if this be a cubit, the Bible says here that the water covered the mountains over 15 cubits. If we were talking about Moses, the height of Moses, 22 and a half feet. Think about this. That is unbelievable. Now, verse 21 starts to sober the reality of what's taking place. All flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all of mankind. I'm super thankful that baby started crying right when I did that, because that's how you should feel. So there's only one person in here that's really registering this. (laughs) Everybody else is just looking at me like adults. Yeah, little Miss Baker. I love little Miss Baker over there. Yes, and so hear me. Everything. This is a worldwide flood. If, in fact, it's true. Even if there's a thousand people on the earth, though so many believe that there were billions. Eight people were saved. Now, you, we look at this and think, man, I'm not sure that I like that. I'm not sure that I like this God. I think there's a part of us that starts to wonder his goodness. We've talked about this idea, the great idea of theonomy, right? The three, do you remember what the three are? This is important. It's very, very important for us to grow in our understanding of how to approach God and his word. What is the theonomy, right? There's three parts. The first God is all-powerful. God's all-powerful, number one, okay? Number two, God is good. He's good, right? Those aren't necessarily difficult to do, right? In the theonomy, it's really easy to have two of three, okay? So God's all-powerful. God is all-good. People suffer. Who? How can we have people suffer with an all-powerful and all-good God? Do you see it? Now, we can take out all-powerful. That feels better. People suffer, and God is all-powerful. Ah, he must be bad. He must be mean, right? You see how two of three feel right? Or we could say, listen, God's really, really good. People suffer. He must not be all-powerful. Do you see it? No. All three are true. God is all-powerful. 
He is good, and people do suffer. And that is the mind-bending reality of what we do here. This is a great example of this. Now, as we continue to the end of our text, before we enter our application, verse 23, and he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. For those of you that don't have the time to do the math, I've done the math. So at this point, we see very clearly that Noah was in the ark for about two and a half months before the tip of the, the top of the mountain was seen. About two and a half months. Four months until they were able to send a dove out and for the dove to return about four months. And then they did not walk off the ark for another eight months, nine months. And so the, so the, the distance between the, the timeline between this week, this chapter, chapter seven, and next week that Pastor Jeff is preaching, so that timeline is about nine months. That's a significant period of time that should be considered. So it's not just like, no, it was on the ark. It went up really fast, went down really fast. No, no, no. In fact, if you look at, this is a fun word. If you look at the idea here in verse 18, the ark floated on the face of the water. That Hebrew word is actually walked. The ark was walking upon the water. The idea there is that the ark's not just going up really quickly and going down really quickly in one place. No, no. The ark was being thrust about on the face of the water like a man who's walking around. That ark was not static. The ark was unbelievably dynamic. I was watching, uh, uh, I've been captivated by praying for and watching uh, Hurricane Ivan, and so I've just been connecting with some churches down there and talking to some different folks, and and we were actually scheduled, me and uh, some folks were scheduled to fly down to Florida, and it looks like some of those things are going to change because of Ivan, but one of the reports that I was watching was a man who actually rode through the storm in a houseboat. Did you see this? Please tell me that you did. And this man was in his houseboat during the storm, and he was moored to a number of other boats that were extremely large vessels. This boat itself was enormous. And as he was talking, he, he was saying, he's like, yeah, the, uh, this boat ended um, in the middle of a parking lot hundreds of yards away from where it was moored. This is a massive vessel. And, I, and he said, he's like, the, the reporter was like, why would you do this? And he's like, I thought the boat was big enough, right? And, uh, and she's like, why, would you ever do it again? He's like, I would never do this again, right? And right, you get this idea, and it's like, yeah, buddy, yeah, you, you needed to have a, a broader council around you for a season. And, uh, but I get it, I totally get it. And, and as I was watching this, this thing looked like the ark. I mean, it was a huge houseboat, had the dimensions, looked like a floating uh, cardboard box, right? Just a massive, and it in a storm that took place for just a few hours was moved hundreds of yards into a parking lot. I can't imagine the addition of, the bursting forth of, the deluge of, and the torrent of months and months of this agitation. And by God's grace, the ark came to a place of rest on, Mary, on Mount Ariat. Jeff will cover next week. Or do you want me to preach your sermon right now? No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. What are our responses? What, what can we possibly respond to this? So I've written down a couple of responses. So you might be thinking, what application are you going to give for this passage? Well, I, I've got four questions for you. Here's my questions. First, Excuse me, I have four possible responses that have a single word question after. Here's a possible response that you might have. I think it's rational. I don't like this history. I don't like this. And then I would ask the question in response to that. Why? Why? I think, that's, I think it's a very fair statement. I think it's a very fair response. I don't like this. I don't like it either. This is scary. Totally agree. But why don't you like it? Why? What is it? What does you saying that and believing that say about how you see God, who is all powerful, who is good, even in the midst of people suffering? Second, I don't believe this history. I don't believe this. Okay. 
Why? Why don't you believe it? Why don't you believe it? Well, this just seems too far-fetched. Totally agree. You know what else seems far-fetched? A dude being raised from the dead. A virgin birthing the Messiah of the world, whose dad was God. Stepdad Joseph. Yeah, I think it was funny too, Henry. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen, my children think I'm hilarious. Right? You know what else sounds crazy? A guy coming back from heaven to judge the earth named Jesus, who then will bring his people back to a heavenly place that will then be on the earth, and we will live ruling and reigning there for eternity. It's crazy, I know. Yeah, so if you say, I don't believe this history, it's like, okay, what do you believe? I mean, I'm asking, really, what do you believe? Because you got to do something with it. And then here's my favorite. Here's a response. Here's a response. My favorite. I think I'm just going to ignore your questions and just watch the Cowboys game in like 12 minutes <laughs> and pretend like you're not talking to me like this. And I'm going to stuff it really deep. I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to go about being merry and never come back to your church again. <laughs> right? Right, that's, that's an option. It's an option. Friends, 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 friends. At your peril. At your peril. I mean, Jesus in Matthew 24 references this. It will be like the days of Noah. It'll be like the days of Noah. He says this. People will be eating and drinking and being merry. People are going to be doing whatever they want. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. And then the Son of Man will come to judge the world. And so don't, I don't like this history. I don't believe this as history. I'll ignore you and enjoy the cowboy game. Here's another response. I'm fearful of this history. Totally fair. Totally fair. Why? Why, is it, why does it make you afraid? And then lastly, I think an appropriate response is this. I want to be on the ark. Like, if, if given the chance, and if Noah were preaching to me, I think I would just say, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Do you have, do you have another room? I'll sleep next to the giraffes or whatever, right? And it is God's grace that you have access to the ark. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You have an ark waiting for you. Don't fall asleep. Wake up. Don't stuff away conviction. Listen to conviction. Don't just dismiss it because it feels weird. Yes, it requires faith. Totally does. And I pray that through the reading of this word, that you, those that are not Christians in here would come to faith. Those that are enslaved to unbelief of other things would just be woken up. Those who would love to stuff it down and maybe you've, you're halfway through your to-do list. Maybe you're halfway through. Oh, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Oh no, he's talking to me. Wake up. God's word is telling us to wake up. Band, if you wanna come on as we enter the time of the Lord's Supper. Every week we, uh, for those of you that don't know, every week, we engage the Lord's Supper. We receive the Lord's Supper. Why? Because we believe the preached word is important every week. Very, very important. We believe that worshiping uh, the Lord uh, in song is very, very important. Every week, we want to gather and fellowship together. We think that is very important. And every week, we want to remember the most important event in history, the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. Church, if you will gather the bread. In Matthew 26, on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, 
He takes this bread in the midst of a Seder meal. He breaks the bread. It's, he doesn't tear it. He breaks it. And he takes this bread to his disciples, and he says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Church, let us remember. And in like manner, the Bible records that in Matthew 26, in other gospels as well, that Jesus takes the cup, it would have been wine, he takes the cup and he says, this is my, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. So when he shed his blood, it shifted where God was no longer satisfied in blood sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus, the ultimate and perfect lamb of God, was sacrificed. And I know that sounds gory, especially for those of us that aren't hunters and aren't used to that. This is gory because sin requires sacrifice. And so Jesus takes the cup in remembrance, and he says to his disciples, take and drink. Church, let us drink. Father, we, we, we pause and thank you for the sending of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that like Noah preached repentance and eight people entered the ark. Today, we can turn from our sin because of the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. Would you help us to believe that? For those of us that do not believe, for those of us that are enslaved, for those of us that are, that are, that are asleep, would you wake us up and see Christ high and lifted up. Father, you are holy, holy, holy. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. For more information, visit our website at lighthousentx.com.